Cathedral Cross, June 1886. Susan Marks fiddled with the silver ring hanging by its thin silver chain from her neck, the blue stone twinkling in the warm sunlight as they whirled west on the old turnpike road. They turned to Chippenville and headed north. For some time the road was quite awful, and her father, Riley Marks, shook his head and cursed mildly, worried Topsy or Flying Top might misstep and hurt themselves, irritated also at the bouncing they took as the wheels of the rig ran in and out of the ruts of the road. After twenty minutes, though, as suddenly as the end of a summer storm, the road widened and became a well-kept thing. The ruts were gone, the road surface was now smooth and well-compacted. Riley breathed a sigh of relief. Ah, we have arrived in New Germany. New Germany, Susan said, surprised. She had never heard of the place. Well, I call it that, her father replied. Most people call it Washington Township. Why call it New Germany, then? Riley just laughed, flicked the horses, and said, You'll see soon enough, my dear. Now they swept rapidly along the empty country road, a plume of dust a hundred feet long announcing their passing. Where were all the people, Susan wondered. The countryside was beautiful, with neat farmhouses, abundant crops, and healthy-looking animals, but there was not a single solitary soul to be seen. Then up ahead she saw a great building, wrapped in scaffolding, rising from a distant hilltop. What's that? she exclaimed, pointing. She knew what it was, of course. It had to be a church, but to see such a church here in rural Clarion County seemed like a daylight dream. It was built of white stone and looked exactly like pictures she had seen of cathedrals in Europe. Even behind the scaffolding the walls seemed impossibly tall, and the steeple seemed to leap free from the construction site below to nearly touch the clouds. That is St. Michael's Rock Church. They've been working on it for four years now. It looks like a European cathedral, she said in surprise. You're correct. It's a one-quarter replica of the cathedral at Freiburg in Germany. I believe Father Mayer traveled over there to make sketches and take dimensions. But how could such a thing be built here? It doesn't seem possible. Riley glanced over at her, smiled, and said, The people of the parish set their minds and their hearts on the project, and they went ahead and did it. Nearly every family in a five-mile radius of the town of Freiburg is Catholic or of German descent. Some contributed money, but they also held picnics and fairs to raise funds. Father Mayer auctioned off his prize stallion. Stonemasons were brought from Germany, and every man around with a special skill was pressed into service. Everyone helped, and I do mean everyone. Mothers complained of the ruination of their children's good clothes on account of the young ones being put to work hauling rocks during lunch and after school. I tell you, that church required an effort that will bind this community together as long as any of them remain alive. But where are these people? I don't believe we've seen a living soul for the last half hour. There's no one in the fields, no one working near the homes. Big day today. They're putting the cross on the steeple, which should be quite something to see. They left the buggy in a yard a couple hundred yards below the church and walked up the middle of the road to join a great crowd standing all around watching operations on the cathedral spire. Cathedral, that was all Susan could think to call it, so different was it from any church she had ever visited. As they made their way through the crowd, her father drew German greetings from all sides. They came to a stop beside an elderly man who was watching the proceedings with intense interest. Workmen standing on the ground and perched on the scaffolding were arranging ropes connected to a huge white cross lying on the ground near the base of the tower. The fuzzy brown ropes curved away, up and up, until they went through pulleys attached to beams mounted at the very summit of the steeple, and then fell back to earth to where thirty men loosely held the lines and stood waiting. Susan saw men with poles who would guide the cross as it was lifted. She saw a man carefully climbing towards the top of the steeple, a bucket slung on his back. That surely did look a perilous undertaking. This operation would be a very interesting one to see. Watching the cross being raised so high in the air would be exciting enough. How in the world was it to be attached to the steeple? Good morning, Judge Marks, said the old man, his English thick with accent, but perfectly understandable. Good morning, Mr. Dietz. Things have come a long way since I last visited with you. Yes, fastening the cross will be the last difficult task. Once that is done, the rest of the job will take only a month or two. I'm surprised you're not out there supervising. Mr. Dietz smiled quietly. It is a matter of using the best persons for the job. The man in charge knows everything there is to know about block and tackle work. And as for the work at the top, 
Well, both Henry Hargenreiter and Albert Niederreiter know as much as any of us. It is not a task many people ever get to do, this fastening of a cross to a church steeple. Still, they are clever, strong young men. I hope this is enough. It is dangerous work. Zien! The one sharp word quieted the crowd. The men holding the ropes began to pull while others held the cross, steadying it as it sat up on the ground. Now it was upright. Now it was swaying free of the earth, the men in the scaffolding above pushing at the taut ropes with T-shaped poles to hold the huge cross away from the side of the church and the timber work. Slowly, smoothly, the cross glided upward. Susan was fascinated. It almost looked as if it was floating towards the heavens of its own volition, like some oddly shaped hot air balloon. But at the top of the scaffolding, when the lines became tangled, the truth was revealed. Halt! The word rang like a pistol shot, and the men responded. Then a staccato burst of shouted German sent men scurrying through the scaffolding to undo the snarl. Another five minutes, and the man on the ground seemed satisfied. Gave another imperious command. Zien sie langsam! Slowly the cross cleared the main scaffolding and rode upward towards the waiting arms of the man perched high above. Who is the man on the steeple? asked Riley. Henry Hargenrader. Niederreiter is inside the steeple with the bolts, said Mr. Dietz, quietly, breathlessly. Hargenrader reached far out, got a hand on the cross, and pulled it to him, then used a series of hand signals that caused more German commands to be shouted down below. First the cross was raised a little and then lowered. This operation was repeated again and again until finally they got it right, and the lower arm of the cross began to descend into the top of the steeple. Only then did Susan understand. There was a hole up there, a hole exactly the size to take the bottom arm of the cross. Inside there must be a way for Albert Niederreiter to bolt it into place. How clever! How simple! Now Henry Hargenreiter took a trowel from his bucket and began applying something around the base of the cross. Susan smiled. Cement! Of course! That would make the connection of the cross to the steeple strong and proof against the weather. Hargenreiter returned the trowel to the bucket then took a knife and cut the ropes, freeing the cross from its earthly bonds. The crowd around yelled and cheered, and even though the exclamations were in German, Susan heard the people's satisfaction, pride, and relief at the successful completion of the dangerous job. Now Henry Hargenreiter moved his legs to straddle the base of the cross, returned the knife to the bucket, and then produced a bottle of something. Susan thought perhaps it was paint or some kind of varnish. Quickly, Henry Hargenreiter undid the top of the bottle, tilted his head back, and drank. Mr. Dietz muttered, Dumm cough, but there was a smile on his lips. The people all around laughed and pointed. Riley whispered in her ear, Quite a distinction, I would say. Probably the only man who will ever drink a beer while perched on top of the steeple of St. Michael's Church. Susan smiled. She liked these people. She couldn't understand a word they said, but there was something about the place, some sort of communal magic in the air.